You have uh, produced uh, a handful of movies, uh, executive produced, and now we have tape heads, which is, I guess it's something that's near and dear to your heart with video and uh, the boom that's going on right now. What prompted you, on a personal level, to get involved with the why tape heads? Well, uh, it's, <clears throat> it's really a, a logical extension of Repo Man to me. Uh, um, uh, number one, the producer of Repo Man, Peter McCarthy, brought tape heads to me. Number two, I was familiar with the whole genre because of my involvement with music videos and, and the early days of MTV and such. Uh, number three, it was also an impressionistic film. Uh, I like films that, uh, that create a different type of narrative. I don't like just ordinary stories. Um, so, uh, and, and it was full of music. So with all of those things, it became irresistible, and I just said, well, yeah, let's try to do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's just all And it was funny. Yeah, that's right. It has, and it's got two good. It had it has two good actors. Well, it, not, not, actors. not when they were not not when it, it first came. We decided to do it. Right, uh, right. Tim and John John came on. Tim Robbins and John Cusack came on later. But actually, John's agent had called me up and said, you know, John has just seen Repo Man and wants to let you know that if you decide to do another picture, he'd like to be in it. <laughs> not bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I said, well, well, let me send you a script if something comes up. Because I just finished a movie called Square Dance, which was my Lowe. first attempt at kind of drama and narrative, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and um, I, it was a, an excellent film. But I, I was a little bit adrift. I didn't exactly know how to make a film like that work. Not only did I not know creatively, but I also didn't know from how to get it to the people that want to see it. Mm. And when you have a film like Repo Man or Tape Heads, you have to really fight for the constituency of the film. There are people that like it. And you've got to go out there and you've got to find those people and you've got to bring the film to them. Mm -hmm. It's a very tough job. Sometimes you have to go against some of the marketing things. So yeah. uh, uh, it was, uh, it, it, tape heads fit everything and it was something I could fight for. Right. right. Now you were uh, mentioning about your past films, uh, Repo Man, uh, Time Rider, which I liked by the way, oh, yeah. I enjoyed that. Uh, it was a fun movie. Uh, yeah, yeah. And Square Dance, uh, as you say, dramatic. Mm -hmm. It's a very eclectic mix of movies. I mean, you know, we have a lot of different uh, factors in those films. Uh, how do you know personally when the project is right for you to get involved in them? I mean, is there something, a little light that goes off in your head or something? Yeah, there really is. Uh, there is. There is a confluence of events that comes together and it just says, this is a, uh, this is a fully realized creative vision. Uh, it's the power of the idea and back of it. If somebody comes and waves their, waves their arms and talks to you about some fabulous thing that could conceivably happen, you have to know, you have to see in their, in, I have to see in their, in their minds that all the pieces are, are put together. Mm -hmm. And uh, that if there are pieces that aren't put together, that they will fall into place at some point. Um, so when that happens, when somebody talks to you about something that they know what they're talking about, there's a certain truth to it, a reality to it, um, a little light goes off. You just know. And there's also a light that goes off when they talk to you about stuff they don't know what they're talking about. You know, one's red, one's green. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the green one said, yeah, follow this out. And that's what happened with tape it. Mm. Now, this is really, I mean, in the age we're in right now, high-tech videos, uh, the music TV channels, uh, uh, TV coming in and as we go into the 90s. I mean, this is, it was perfect timing for this movie, isn't it? I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better time. Yeah, well, I, but I think we've sort of fell into a tub of butter with that. I mean, there's a lot of people who say that, gee, you know, you invented the music video. Well, what happened was I started doing music videos at the beginning when other people started doing music videos too. I didn't invent the music video. There was a half a dozen people out there working in the forum. I just happened to be there at the right time. Same thing with tape hits. I mm -hmm. guess. Yeah, it's perfect timing, but it was not anything we planned. Yeah. And, and, as, and as far as executive producer, a lot of people see that, Michael, and they, and they don't really know what those duties are, what you have to go through. How much creative input did you have with the production of this film? Well, it's sort of like the Queen's veto. Uh, <clears throat> you sit at the top of the creative pyramid, but you really, you have to leave everybody alone. I mean, you can't, uh, and, and so the result was that I had virtually no creative input into it. I just had, I trust Bill Fishman, I trusted Peter McCarthy, and, uh, and I knew that they would come up with a good, uh, with, with something good. Uh, I couldn't have backed it up uh, just myself, and it, you know, it's a, there, there are dozens of people who come together to make something like this happen. Brandon Tartikoff over at NBC was my partner in this thing uh, from a financial standpoint. 
Um, I had a lot of support from the creative community with a lot of agents who brought, you know, like John Cusack's agent who says you know, he'll do the film. And, and as an executive producer, you sit at the intersection for that and try to steer everybody or steer all these, these energies into the right place so that it can help the film. But in terms of actually making a decision and saying, no, don't do that, I won't have that, it, it really is the queen's veto. You, you, when you exercise that, you do more damage than you do good for the most part. So you just basically sit quiet and let the thing unfold. Mm -hmm. Now, in the past uh, several years, you've been you've had your own video company. You've done a lot with video. Uh, I know you're going to do video publishing is one of one of the things that's coming up in the future. Going back, going let's go back to the, just for a couple questions to the to the '60s and the time you know of, of national prominence with the monkeys and. and uh, that whole time period in your life. How do you think your work on the monkeys has impacted on your current career, if it has at all? Well, it's hard to know. I mean, <clears throat> I think it's important to keep in mind that the monkeys were basically nine people. I mean, the four of us were very visible, um, but there were, there were four or five people in back of us who, who, who formed a creative team. And the real experience and advantage I got was from working with that creative team. That creative team, I mean, the only one you would probably know is, is Jack Nicholson, uh, who, was, who was around during those times. But it was Jack and Bob Rafelson and Bert Schneider, Bob Rafelson, who's, a, who's gone on to direct, Bert Schneider, a producer, mm -hmm. a guy named Steve Blauner, and a director named Jim Frawley, and, and, and then the four of us. Um, we were on camera, but I learned, but you know, it was, it was the push of these other guys uh, who, who encouraged us along all different lines, m musically, cinematically, all, all other ways. And um, it was learning to work in that environment of uh, high-powered creative minds uh, that uh, was the most advantageous to me. Mm. I didn't really pick up any technical skills. I didn't learn how to set up a shot or how to mm -hmm. do any technique. I didn't learn anything about story structure or or putting together a television show, making deals or anything like that. What I learned to do was to work as part of a team. Mm -hmm. And that was a, and, and part of a team that, that w of really good players. Mm -hmm. One time I was in Nashville and I was playing with, you know, ha ha had a guitar pulling and we were all sitting around playing. And it was with some real heavyweight players. And at the end of one particular song, uh, one of the guys in, in the group offered up, well, it sure is nice to play with people who can pick. And, and that's the, that's the. That's what happened with the monkeys. It was sure nice to be in a group of people who could really do it. You know, yeah, and work together and and learn from that. And during that period of your life, which was high visibility, uh, what do you what did you enjoy most about uh, that time period? You think? Well, I think what I just outlined is is was not only was it most advantageous, it was the most joyful. I really enjoyed it, and um, you know to be able to pick up the telephone or to have dinner with. Uh, one of these guys and just uh, kick ideas around and think of something. I mean, when we wrote the music, when we wrote the movie Head, which was the Monkees movie, mm -hmm. um, the four of us and Jack and Bob and Bert all went up to a little place in uh, north of Los Angeles called Ojai, sat around a country club there and just talked into a tape recorder. Well, that was real fun. At the end of the day, you know, there was this kind of odd movie that came out. Wonderful little film. Really interesting, creative film. Um, and to be able to play with people who can pick is not only educational, it's just it's the most fun you can have, at least most fun I can have. Mm -hmm. And how about, uh, I mean, that time in the limelight as far as what bothered you the most or you, you liked least about that business or that time period? Well, I've always been a little uncomfortable with, uh, with uh, fame. And um, the high recognition factor was difficult for me, uh, especially because of the way it was. Uh, you know, there was a, a kind of stir. So I couldn't go to the drag races or to the baseball games or to the museum or, or, or to a, you know, a boat show. I mean, I, I, and, and I missed that because, of, you know, now I go to those places. The recognition factor is low, number one. It's been a long time. Number two, what recognition factor there is is generally very respectful and distant and kind of, you know, 
uh, sort of Mr. Nesmith, you know, people come up and shake your hands and, uh, gee, I really, and, then you, and I never know what I'm going to hear. Is it going to be Elephant Parts, Rio? Is it going to be Repo Man? Is it going to be some Pacific Arts title? I don't know what it's going to be, but it's always very, very kind. Yeah, well, that's interesting because uh, you made an effort, obviously, to go in a different direction in, in, in I don't know if you made an effort to disassociate from the monkeys, but you had you kept your career going in a positive direction in a lot of different outlets. Uh, was that conscious? I mean, because these, you know, I've interviewed Davy Jones before, and I know they've done a lot of the, you know, they've gone around and they've got new records now, and they're and they're touring. Was that a conscious effort during that time period, or was it just the way that it was fate? Well, <clears throat> it was conscious in uh, to the degree that I subscribed to the theory of the whole man, uh, and uh, I, I just didn't want to. Uh, have an idea and not act on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea of starting my own business and doing my own movies and making music videos and all that stuff, when it came up, you know, it, it seemed like, well, here's an idea now, you know, go forward and, and do, uh, do whatever the, the demands of the idea are. Um, and there wasn't a lot of activities around the monkey's time, uh, you know, because the monkey's basically had when the television show went off the air, uh, no more, no more activity. Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, twenty-year period in there where it wasn't really a, any effort to disassociate myself from that. I have no desire to do that. Uh, it was an effort to uh, just continue to expand my own thinking and and to um, uh, be productive and, mm -hmm. and and helpful or whatever you yeah. know seemed to be the right thing at the time. And speaking about Rio, a lot of people may not know that uh, how Rio got started and that tell the story because I think it's very interesting. I mean, it's almost like the mini birth of music television? Well, in a way it is, although like, uh, like I've said many times, I, I, it was more I was just kind of present at the birth, not, you know, seminal. <laughs> the, um, the record company that I had at the time, uh, I made a record called Rio, and the record company said that they would like to promote it in Europe, and the way to do that was to make a, a clip, a promotional clip film clip mm -hmm. for it. And would I please make one for Rio? So I did. And uh, I took it over there to deliver. The company was based in London, and they had assembled their 30 guys uh, from, uh, from around. And, uh, when, and they were looking at all the various clips. And as I sat and watched the clips go through, I realized that everybody was performing. Basically, they had a picture of the band, and microphones, and guitars, and whatever they played, and they, they performed. And I thought, oh, brother, when they see mine, I'm going to be in trouble because I've made this kind of movie, and right. I don't know whether they're going to like it. And after it was over, they all stood up and cheered. And I thought, well, that's great. So they really liked it. And, and it also made me realize that uh, there was something special here. That was really good. But that was the first time I knew it. I didn't realize it when I was making it at all. I was just making a clip for the, for the record. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I did have a very conscious desire to have the music drive the image. Uh, and I was not in any sense trying to make a commercial for a record. I was, I was really trying to work in an art form. Mm -hmm. um, that, was a, that was a signal difference. When I got back home and I thought about that a little bit, I thought, well, this really is an art form, and this could this could blossom into something. So I, I thought, can I do another one? And I called the guy that I'd done Rio with, and we made another one called Cruisin'. And uh, it worked again, sort of the same way. And then I and and, and subsequent to that, I made Elephant Parts, mm -hmm. and uh, which was which is still a cult favorite, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah, it really well, still sells on video. Yeah, yeah. It does very well. Yeah, Rent yeah. sells does very sure, well. Sure, yeah, it's out there. And uh, that was. Um, uh, that was how I started, and it was kind of how I came on to the. It just developed slowly in my mind over over doing it many times that that there was there was more to this video business than just than, than met the eye. No yeah. pun intended. And now we have what we have, MTV. We have VH1. Uh, there are several shows, uh, Friday night videos. I mean, this is, it's really it's been pretty hot for what about nine, ten years now? Would you say? Well, yeah. I mean, I took MTV to uh, to Warner. Warner Amex. It was Warner. It was a, 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 a Warner Brothers and American Express had formed a cable company. They had an idle transponder in the sky, and I said, you know, we could, you could do 24-hour day television format, and you could play these music clips. And they said, well, nobody makes these music clips. I said, 
put the thing on the air, believe me, they they'll will. make them. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, we, we did a, a test pilot uh, series called Pop Clips, which we put on the Nickelodeon channel for a few months, and the needle just went off the meter. And uh, then they said, okay, let's, you know, let's do it 24 hours a day. And, um, and I made this, the decision at that point, I'd like to stay in the creative side, and I could see it was going to turn into a business. So I just basically sold them the, the concept and, and went home. Um, and they, you know, it went on, went on from there. How do you think the um, music television business has changed since its early beginnings? I think it's probably become less conscious of itself as an art form and more of really just commercials for records. Mm. I don't know whether that's bad or good. Uh, I think what has to happen is we've got to, we've got to let another four or five years go by, let the next generation of thinkers come along and, and, and get hold of the form. Um, what we have right now is a lot of people who are basically in the record business and in the radio business uh, utilizing this form. Uh, and what will happen, I think, in, in pretty, the, pretty near future is that there will be some people who are now 12 uh, who will come to it as an actual form itself and, and begin to rewrite uh, the way it's perceived creatively. So I think it will mature out of what it is right now. Yeah, you think they got away from the idea of what it was supposed to be a little bit? Yeah, I think, and probably wisely. I'm not sure that it would have existed, have, have lived. I mean, you know, you have to crawl before you can walk. Right, right. And one of the offshoots, which I found interesting, interesting uh, reading in, in the bio, is this video publishing. Now, tell us what this is about, what you're going to be doing with video publishing. Well, I have a video company called right. Pacific Arts, and, and, we, and we put out basically sell-through types of video cassettes. Over the years, I've built a large catalog of, well, documentary is the wrong type of word, but essentially sell-through type of cassettes, uh, things that you might want to have. Started off with elephant parts. I mean, people said, can we buy a copy of this? And I thought, well, sure, why not? So, And um, then as I've been in the video business, I've begun to realize that if, uh, if there was a way to deliver on a serialized or continuity basis, the same program, kind of like a magazine, mm -hmm. that uh, you could be of great service to people. You know, be able to go down to the supermarket and pick up uh, this week's episode. I also like the idea of um, of the magazine as a prototype, the, the print magazine as a prototype for a video cassette that you could you could actually have these these cassettes uh, uh, not only coming out periodically, but you could also structure it in such a way that people could use their little remote and shuttle past the things that they didn't want to see. That means it could be as long as you wanted it to be. You didn't have to watch it all in one sitting. A lot of things that seemed to be close to a publishing and, and, uh, and book type analog. So uh, a couple of years ago I designed a magazine which was uh, called uh, Overview. It is called Overview. Basically it was like the video guide, mm -hmm. previews of coming attractions on video. Uh, not just the top ten, but some unusual pieces, kid videos, humorous videos, how-to gardening videos, mm -hmm. things like that. And um, have been working over the last two years to structure a distribution system that would allow magazines like Overview uh, on video cassette to come out on a regular basis. And this fall, we're going to come back with Overview. We're going to come back with, and we're going to come out with. Um, uh, several other magazines uh, much more focused on to the enthusiasts. I won't get into it too much because we'll make a big announcement. In, right, it'll be a big press summer. conference and That's we, right. we can attend then, right? Yeah, then, okay. in, uh, in August. All right. But uh, there, there, there's about a half a dozen of them that we'll be coming out with uh, that uh, will hit the, hit the stands September, October. So you have a lot of creati creative energies uh, going in, in specific directions and you know exactly what you want to do. What about the young people out there? I know that you're associated with AFI. I mean, how about young people wanting to get into the business and getting into videos? Uh, what do you say to them if they, if they can't get the break? Where, where should they go? Um, they should go to a, the, you know, the local hardware store and, and buy, a, buy a, a, a little video camera and start making films and learn the dialogue of film uh, at home. You know, there is such a thing as garage videos. And uh, uh, if, you, if you talk to the professor of, uh, 
of uh, creative writing at Stanford, he or she will say, write. And, if you, and, and it is just uh, a standard piece of advice. If you want to do it, then do it. <laughs> Get a camera and go do it. And once you start doing it, uh, it, the next step will unfold. If you sit in your couch at home thinking, gee, I sure would love to do that, then you're not doing it. Get up off of the couch, turn the television off, <laughs> go out, get a video camera, get some friends and film something. Mm -hmm. Make a little story, make a movie, make a, shoot a music video, shoot, take a picture of your backyard, anything, you, could, you have to start. That's the, that's, that's ground roots, you have to start there. Uh, and, and as we move into the end of the century, and uh, with so much going on, as we said, with, a, with high definition television and everything else happening, what do you think is going to happen video-wise that will surprise us? Um, well, the, the big shift in the media right now, from where I can see it, uh, is linked to computers. And <clears throat> what, I'll just give you a very broad stroke analogy and you can take it where you want to and what it might mean to the video future. Certainly uh, computers are learning as Apple has demonstrated that they need to be graphics based and not text based in order to be friend user friendly. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to kind of moving pictures and computers interface from a hardware standpoint. But there's a bigger uh, a bigger force on the horizon and this is the analogy to that force. Right now, we're in what I call the town crier era. That means that you or me or somebody goes in the middle of the town square and, and sounds off about what he wants, as many people as can hear him, to know. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be, hundreds of years ago, that that was one guy talking to 25 people that lived in the immediate range of his voice, and he would go and scream, say, everything's okay, and then he'd go back and go right. to sleep. We're moving from that into uh, another era which is the networking era, but it's not network like network television. It's networking in a way that everybody in the town opens their windows and everybody talks to everybody. So that you have uh, not one person talking to 20, you have 20 people talking to 20. And the computer makes that possible because the computer, number one, gives you access to all those other 20 people allows you to order that information, to prioritize it in a way that's meaningful to you, and to give your information out into the public arena where other people can organize it and prioritize it as it is meaningful to them. Arthur C. Clarke calls it a nervous system, this big communication things that we, thing that we have. Uh, fairly profound shift. Fairly profound. Very profound shift. And it, it says, Right now, we have maybe 10,000 people talking to 10 million. In 10 years, you're going to have 10 million people talking to 10 million. Mm. Let's yeah, think of that. Yeah. It's, it's mind-boggling, really. It is. It's extraordinary. And wrapping up with a good segue uh, on computers, if you were sitting down at a computer and had to program, say, the next five years of Michael Nesmith's life, what would that program read, do you think? Uh, well, uh, the, uh, the the uh, first thing I would do is turn that computer off <laughs> and not make any attempt to program it at all. Uh, you know, it, my life is a bit like uh, sailing, and uh, you set your sails in the winds. Where they blow, that's where you go. And so far, this, the winds have been uh, whipping up pretty well. You're doing very well. Well, so far, I'm on a reach, you know. Yeah, you <laughs> it's are. very nice. I got, them, got the jib <laughs> yeah. out, and I'm rolling. You're rolling. <laughs> it's great. Well, thank you very okay. much. I appreciate it. Good. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay.